you to say, hi, everybody. <laughs> we love Legs and Jillian. We love Legs and Jillian. With all our hearts. Stop. Stop. We are punks at heart. <laughs> so watch the... Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is a real honor for me because I am a huge fan of this book that they co-authored together, Please Kill Me. And obviously the book that... that um, that has just come out, Dear Nobody, The True Story of Mary Rose, is the most astonishing book, and I really, really, really want you to buy it and, and spread the word about this thing, because it's a, it's a terribly important uh, story, both her story and the story of the two authors, the brilliant legend Neil and Gillian McCain, who, who put this together. They, they were confronted by tremendous odds not to have this book published. Um, and it's about this young girl who wrote these extraordinary notes in her little notebook. Um, she lived a dreadful life, an abusive life, a, a lonely life, a drug-addicted life, and, di and died very young, uh, you know. Um, and uh, I, I want to get into the Q&A with these guys after they've done the readings from both this book and from Please Kill Me and discuss that, this whole issue of this abused kid, this lonely kid, uh, and how brilliant this, these notebooks really are, which is what they did. They edited these notebooks together for this book. And it, it is an amazing story, a really important story, and it should be spread everywhere. The, 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 the theme of this book is a very important subject for what uh, our culture... <laughs> Uh, I, I don't even know, but it sounds like, you know, whenever I use the word American culture, I think of a, what is that thing that you test diseases in? Petri dish? A petri dish. I'm sorry, I just got back from Europe where, where perhaps, uh, you know, uh, we shall stuff. leave uh, and go to. But, um, so dig this. So I'm going to just uh, quickly prepare you for this. Uh, Legs McNeil. Who doesn't love Legs McNeil and, and Jillian McCann? Come on, I mean, get, you know. I'm going to, you know what, this book, please kill me, it's a punk classic. And I, I'm going to read a few quotes from it, just so to put it in context. Let's hang on. Uh, uh, because you should know what this book what this book meant to me and certainly meant to you. Thank you. I, uh, it's so brilliantly described by a few people. Dig this quote. Please kill me does for the Ramones what the disciples did for Jesus. <laughs> Is that the greatest thing? I mean, how, yeah, that doesn't put it in context. Oh, there, there are others. Please kill me is lurid, insolent, disorderly, funny, sometimes gross, sometimes mean, and occasionally touching the New York Times, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> which is in itself ridiculous. So, please kill me. This is Time Out, which is a hip British magazine. Please kill me ranks up there with the great rock and roll books of all time. Right, legs? He's very proud. He's a punk, so he can't really look too proud. But inside, he's glowing. He's gloating. He's, he's gloating, exactly. And listen to this. The best rock and roll book ever, and not a word about music. How about that? Hi, Mercy. That was his quote. Yeah. That was Jim's quote. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's good when your husband quotes about your book. Give credit. That's, that's a, that's it was book. before I we hated met it, together. said Jim. <laughs> they met at the book. They got together at the book party. Oh my goodness! Good what a party it was! Yeah. Oh, that's very romantic. It is. See, you write a book and you fall in love. Yeah. That for all your aspiring writers. Sometimes. Uh, Legs McNeil and Gillian McCain understand the dangerous excitement of the '70s punk scene in Manhattan and tap every source of information for their exhaustive, thrilling, filthy, uncensored history. How great is that? So that book is fucking amazing. And if you don't have it, pick it up. It's a really important book. Um, so what they're going to do is, I'm going to introduce them. They're going to get up here, and they're going to read from both books, as I understand it. And after that, I'm going to ask them a couple of questions that uh, I really want to know. So without further ado, I'd love to present Legs McNeil and Jerry McKenna. Why don't you come up? So uh, to give you a short um, uh, little... Uh, synopsis of this book. 
I live in a small town in Schwanksville, Pennsylvania. Schwank? It's very schwanky. Yeah, shut up, Maui. And um, I live across the street from the post office, and uh, my postmaster's in a heavy metal cover band, and he's always borrowing my Beetle boots, you know, and he's wearing them. I used to have like 20 when I moved in, and I had like three or four left, because... They're not as nice as Michael's. No, they're not as nice as Michael's. Michael has the authentic Beetle boot, which, which you can tell is the real Beetle boot, because it's got the seam up the middle. I have the fake ones from Trash and Board, though. Anyway, Fred's kid was over borrowing... He has these really delightful kids, you know, and I don't really like kids, and um, but they're they're really nice. And the daughter was over boring a book for uh, I thought she was in high school, but she was actually in college. And um, I asked her what she'd been, re you know. I always ask people, so what are you reading, you know, because I want to know, um, you know, what people are reading. And uh, she said the best thing I ever read was these journals that my best friend's older sister wrote, who died, and um, that got me very interested. So we're going to read with my lovely... Doesn't Julian's hair look great today? We're going to read from Dear Nobody, and I'm going to start. I think this is mine. Is this yours? No, it's mine. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Everyone's <coughs> Dear Nobody, I hate people. At this point, almost everyone can just violently die. I would sit back and laugh and say, may they burn in hell. I should have been born with a dick so the world could suck it. I want to grow 800 feet tall and scream, fuck you, so that the whole damn world hears it. Then I'll cut off everyone's middle finger and make them shove it up their asses. That way, even deaf people will get my point. <laughs> so uh, she wrote these between age 15 and 17. I just want to put that in. Uh, dear Nobody, trying to make good friends in a new place is one of the hardest things to do, especially for me. I mean, first off, consider how I don't have any friends to make me feel good. Then there's the issue of always having to remember to never be anything less than pleasant and to be really nice to everyone. Then there's the matter of not coming on too strong, not to mention having to remember to always pay attention and be polite when the other person speaks and never put down their opinion, even if they are a little mean or rude. Pretend not to notice. Be even nicer to the ones like that. Always look good. Dress right. Laugh right. Always mention the deepness of my voice so they know I know what or who I sound like already. Thank you very much. Remember not to put myself down so they don't think I've got low self-respect because then they would get low respect from me, even if I was just joking. When getting high, always remember mom and how annoying she can be when she is high and engrave it into my brain not to act like that. Make eye contact with everyone in the group, not just a few people. Don't stare. Don't talk too much. Hide scars. Don't try to prove I know more about something, something than someone else, even if I do. Don't swear too much. Don't spit. Stand up straight. Talk to people so I'm not mistaken for a snob, but don't talk too loud. Don't complain. Don't ask too many questions, but don't not ask questions, or, you think, or they'll think you're not interested. Don't brag, don't talk about myself too much. Maybe I should use a defense mechanism. Maybe I should model myself after someone popular, and then when I get friends, slowly unveil my real personality? No, I am incapable of doing that. I have too forceful a personality. I've just got to remember to exude only my good traits. I'm just too harsh, too dominant, contradictory, and too expressive. I mean, even after I settle down, I'm still a little extra expressive. Dear nobody, I got a job to pay for all the things, this, this going out at McDonald's. Fuck that place. I hate it there. I dropped out of school, so now I work a 40-hour work week, eight days a week, eight, eight hours a day. My boss is a real asshole. Fuck him. He's this bitchy little queer that's always screaming at me until I cry. Fuck him. Or her. Whatever it wants to be. Fuck it either way. <laughs> Anyhow, I haven't shown up for the past two days. I'll get suspended if I do it one more time. Fuck it. I also got in a fight with Jeff, and we haven't talked for forever. I mean, we got in this huge fight. Big. And he's the only one with the car. Vicky had a car, but it broke down one night. Yeah, that was fun. Not. Anyway, maybe I'll call him and apologize. Now that I have this job and all, I want to go out and spend money. But I, wanna, I don't want to do it alone. 
I'll call him tomorrow, maybe. I'll definitely call Vicky, though. Maybe she can hang out with me. Dear everybody, Jesus wouldn't even date my mother. <laughs> Dear nobody, I got my first paycheck and spent most of it partying with Jeff. The rest I went to him or his friends. Last night, he didn't have enough money to get fucked up with because he just bought a new car, so I helped him out a little, like I've been doing all week. Then, even after my immense generosity, Jeff asked to borrow more money. I told him no, that I still wanted to hold on to some of my money, but that I would at least give him gas money. That wasn't enough for him. He got a really smart-ass tone with me and began to raise his voice. It was embarrassing because he was yelling at me in this garage and his folks were home. All I wanted to do was have a good night. So I told him that, but stuck to my decision about not lending him any more money. Well, he flipped the fuck out. I mean, blew up. He suddenly screamed at me, You selfish, spoiled little bitch! My jaw dropped. Selfish? Selfish? I'd given him everything he asked for, but just this once, I deny him, and this is the gratitude I get? Jeff said he was taking me home. I cried all the way in the car while he yelled at me. Then I thought, fuck sitting here listening to all this bullshit about me being a selfish, greedy little bitch because I wouldn't give him any more my money that I worked so hard to earn. I started to yell right back at him, not wanting to lose any more of my pride. Jeff pulled the car over and told me to get out and walk home. We were miles from my house at night, and I had no idea where I was or how to get home, so I refused to get out of the car. I buckled my seatbelt to emphasize the fact that I would not be getting out until I was safely in my own driveway. Jeff responded with more yelling, ferocious yelling. Then being the gentleman he is, he got out of the car, walked over to the passenger side, opened my door screaming, if you don't get out, I'll get you out myself. I clenched my fists at my sides, ready to strike if he so much as touched me. I'll bet he knew not to touch me because he didn't. He just stood there and kept screaming at me. I screamed back, telling him how I'd given him virtually everything he had asked me for. Jeff screamed at me the entire way home. By the time we arrived at my house, my hysterical crying matched his screaming. I gave him two dollars for gas money for taking me home. We didn't speak for a few days after that. Uh, she wrote some letters, too, that um, we incorporated into to her friend Haley. Hey Haley, how's it going? So much fucked up shit has been happening to me. I don't know if it's all good or all bad. I don't know if I should be happy or freak the fuck out. Well, I've been getting fucked up for free every day lately, and I've been making acquaintances, and I fall in love with a new person every day. But there's this one guy, Ryan, that I just can't seem to shake. He's so placid and tranquil. A thinker like you, Haley. One thing I'm not is placid, and I've never been described as tranquil. Passionate and um, ambitious, okay, I guess. Whereas you two may be more analytical, where I would be more curious. Understand? Well, I'm telling you this because you would get it more than anyone else. So for the past few weeks, we've been talking and throwing glances at each other. It took him a while, but I got some of his ice to break, and his natural warmth melted most of mine. I was still usually quieter around him, but when he came around, everybody else vanished, and he became my audience. And what do I do for an audience? Perform. Well, one day my mom's boyfriend got drunk and came down to where we usually hang out. He bought us a case of beer. We were all drinking. I had eight beers in about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. I wasn't drunk, just buzzing a little. My mom's boyfriend was the most fucked up. He looked at my crush and asked Ryan if he had a job. And when my guy said, no, mom's boyfriend said, well, Mary Rose really likes you, so you bet you have a job now. Let me say that when I drink, I like to be the party. I make jokes and inspire the drunken debates of conversation more than anyone else in the room. Well, I was in a rare form compared to what my crush was used to seeing of me. He laughed at all my jokes and I caught him looking at me, but maybe that was in shock since I seemed so contrary to my usual self. Ha, huh, I was getting pretty drunk as the night progressed. I borrowed somebody's shirt and I threw up all over it. Ryan was watching. I didn't want to gross him out, but I had to sit down. Somebody said, she's puking all over your shirt. I go, I'm not puking on it, I'm customizing it. <laughs> Everyone laughed and so did he. Well, a little later I started getting bitchy and bossy, but I had a sense of humor about it. 
I don't think he expected me to be the type to get rowdy, but I was very rowdy. We had fun, but I don't think he expected it. Long story short, I caught him in a lie, but I acted like I didn't notice. That disappointed me. Nothing hurts like being lied to. But I surprised him a few times that night with my deceptiveness, but I didn't lie. So I figure we're even, and I crush on him even more now that I'm comfortable with him. Well, it turns out the next day, after the night of surprises, Ryan stands me up. I was devastated. So I did the only reasonable thing I could think of. I got even drunker than the night before, and called Ryan and cursed him out until he hung up on me. Another thing he probably didn't think I was capable of. He thought I was above that, I guess. You know, like I was ultra passive or something, or something. Not when I'm drunk. So when he hung up, I called right back, and his mom answered and said he wasn't there. She probably guessed I was fucked up. Ryan was probably pissed. Yep, looks like I blew that one. So I go get this cute guy that I'm attracted to, but wouldn't date. And we were making out in my basement. When my mom got home, I guess she was locked out of the house, and I was too busy to hear her knocking at the door, so she breaks the window to get in and found us. She wasn't that pissed, but we left anyway. I came home late that night and woke up around 4 a.m. under the coffee table in the living room. I was still fucked up. My mom came downstairs and says, what are you doing? I said, leave me alone. I'm camping. See, I'm weird when I'm drunk, but at least I have a sense of humor about it. Anyway, guess I scared the shit out of Ryan. So much for pretending to be tranquil. Should have been myself from the start. I wanted Ryan to, be, to like me, no matter how much it hurt. So now I end up with the one I could love, shaking his head like, what the fuck? And some guy I just saw was cute is almost in love with me. I call it karma. It all balances out. Maybe Ryan just needs time to di digest what's been going on. Besides, once I get in somebody's system, it's pretty hard to get me out completely. Ryan has a Virgo mom, and you're a Virgo, so maybe you'd be able to help me with him. Anyway, I love you, I love you, I love you tons. Love forever, Mary Rose. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing about Dear Nobody, I'll, I'll just, just, just end it this way, is that um, when I read, I like to say that I read uh, Go Ask Alice when I was like 11 or 12, but I think I was actually really like 14 or 15, you know, I stole it from some girl. Yeah, it was in right. paperback, you know, and I said, oh, babe, oh, of course I'll, and I also borrowed money from the cigarettes and beer and everything else that I could get off her. But anyway, that's besides the point. But if, even when I read Go Ask Alice, I knew, something intuitively told me that this was a fraud, which it turned out in the 80s that Go Ask Alice was made up by its Avon editor, which really, really pissed me off. And I had been searching for the real Go Ask Alice for the last 40 years, I think, or 50, God, never mind, for a long time. Anyway, um, and I, th I, think I, I think we found it in, in Dear Nobody. When did you read Go Ask Alice? You were uh, after I read Dear Nobody. Really? Yeah. You didn't read it as a... <laughs> Do people still read Go Ask Alice? Yeah? No. Yeah? Or is it just old people? <laughs> just old people. <laughs> Neither. Anyway. It was okay. a TV movie, and that's what everyone watched. Oh, yeah, it was, right? <laughs> that and Dawn, Portrait of a Teenage Runaway, which was also... <laughs> and the Boy in the Bubble. Jan Brady. Yeah. Was that Jan Brady? Yeah. Howie, and Howie Pyro would know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, anyway, we're going to read from uh, this one, Please Kill Me. What page are we starting? Starting on page... Uh, Do we have the same book? Uh, yeah, yeah, the penguin. Uh, page uh, 134. Okay. I start? Yep. Okay. Chapter 15, Open Up and Bleed. Meet shoulders. My first assignment for Main Man was to get Iggy at the airport. David Bowie was on tour with the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, his first big tour. And I had to collect Iggy and bring him to the show. I knew Iggy from the Danny Fields days, so I didn't have to say, Hi, I'm your Main Man representative. He hugged me when he got off the plane. We started talking, and what he wanted to know was if Main Man was for real. You know, what am I involved in here? I couldn't give him a straight answer because I didn't know. But what did I care? I was traveling all country ordering room service. So I said to Iggy, 
Well, what do any of us have, have to lose at this point? Serena Fox. David Bowie and his wife Angela had a very open marriage. They were sleeping with anybody they felt like sleeping with. David and Angela and I had a menage a trois for about five minutes, but then I made her leave because David and I were going to play. Angela was fucking David's black bodyguard, and David and I used to get it down on all fours and peek in the keyhole and watch him fuck. It was sort of like a new toy for David on the Ziggy Stardust, Stardust tour. But while we're in San Francisco, David asked me, are you in love with me? I said, no. I wasn't about to say, yes. I was still tripping around. I had no flies on me then, no salt on my tail. I didn't want to get tied down. Besides, Tony DeFries wanted everybody to be this Bowie thing. I didn't want to cut my hair like that. So I wasn't impressed with them. I mean, okay, I get to go on a plane and go somewhere, but that's all I thought it was. So when David Bowie asked me if I was in love with him and I told him no, he left me there. Lee Childers. I was in Kansas City on my way to Los Angeles working as the advance man on the David Bowie Ziggy Stardust tour when I happened to be talking on the phone to Lisa Robinson. I said, they're going to put us up at the Chateau Marmont. Do you know anything about it? Lisa said, oh sure, it's fine, but don't stay there. Stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I asked why. Lisa said, oh, it's so gorgeous. It's pink, and I'm going to be there. So I said, okay. I called RCA and I said, we don't want to stay at the Chateau Marmont. We want to stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel. The RCA guy said, the Beverly Hills Hotel? I said, the Beverly Hills Hotel. We're all staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And he said, okay. None of us at Main Man had any experience in the rock and roll business at all. But that was one of the things that Tony DeFreeze was very smart about. He knew we'd go to RCA Records and make the demands that he wanted us to make, because we thought that's what he did. DeFreeze's philosophy seemed to be to make outrageous demands on a giant record company for an artist who hadn't sold more than three records. <laughs> We were demanding unlimited air travel, limousines for everyone, all our hotel bills, giant advances in cash, and because we were crowd, uh, loud and crazy looking, we, all, we got all the demands. It was easier for a huge company like RCA to give us whatever we wanted than to listen to us. They didn't want us there at all. So when I'd come in with this blonde hair flying and say, I need 14 tickets to Kansas City, they'd just go, okay, fine, you got them. Just go away. It was a totally unheard of tactic, but it worked. We lived off the credit. I have no idea how much we went into debt with RCA, but of course the philosophy was once you go so far into debt, they didn't dare cut you off because then, they, then they'd never make it back again. So I arrived at the Beverly Hills Hotel three or four days before the whole entourage. 48 people at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I had Olivia de Havilland suite, and David had one of the bungalows out back. He never came out of his room. Angela was fucking his bodyguard in the pool. The funniest thing was that the roadies would go up the Sunset Strip, and pick up tourists, and bring them back to their rooms and order dinner on room service, and the tourists would pay them for the dinners. All our expenses were paid for, so the roadies would go to the Sunset Strip three or four times a day, bring back these tours, sit them down in their room, serve them these fabulous lobster dinners with chocolate souffles, and then charge them for it. The tourists would get cut-rate dinners at the Beverly Hills hotels, and the roadies were making fortunes. <laughs> Serena Fox. I didn't want to go back to New York yet. I was kind of embarrassed, and I didn't want to face Andy Warhol and everyone. I'd run out of money and that bleached my hair, which broke my hair off. I didn't like myself. So when I found out Lee had gotten everyone into the Beverly Hills Hotel, I thought, well, I could hang out there for a while. So I went to the Beverly Hills Hotel, and Iggy and the guys showed up, and that was cool. Because Iggy and I always had a real brother and sister relationship, and I was convinced that Rob Power was his last stab at making it. We had a really long top of, talk about his being his last chance to do something, and I, that he'd better get his shit together and not fuck it up. Then I went and crashed with that guy, what's his name? James Williamson. He had the hot for me big time. What was I doing with that guy? He was so uncool. Yeah, I slept with him, so people keep reminding me. But James wasn't the same litter as Iggy, Ronnie, and Scotty. He was just some stray dog that found his way into the pack. James Winston ruined the Stooges. They didn't need him. Somebody should have chewed his ass out, left him to die. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Childers, I guess Iggy decided he wanted to live in California. I mean, once you're getting free hamburgers from David Bowie, the next thing you see is a house in Hollywood Hills. I mean, you get what you can. So Iggy said, I want to live in Hollywood. Then it was our job to find him a house. 
I had to go back to New York, so I left of all people, Sorinda Fox in Hollywood to house hunt for Iggy while he lived at the Beverly Hills Hotel. <laughs> Sorinda found this amazing house. It was right up off of Mulholland Drive at the very peak of the mountain, and it had a huge swimming pool and four bedrooms. Once Iggy had the house, I was dispatched back to live in the apartment over the garage, like the chauffeur, and be Iggy's caretaker. It was difficult living with Iggy because he was at the height of his junkiedom, and I was inexperienced in the ways of a true rock and roll junkie, how you would deceive, cajole, flirt, and manipulate in order for me not to realize the massive amounts of treachery he was up to. My job was to keep him straight, but he was too quick for me. With all the roadies, groupies, and band members hanging around, I could never cut off his supply. Sorinda Fox. James Williamson got sick one night, threw up some wine or something, and he didn't make it to the toilet. It was all over the bathroom. So gross. And then he just left it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I am not cleaning this shit. I think that's when I said, I'm out of here. I was gone. That's when I went back to New York and stayed, started hanging out with David Johansson again. Ron Ashton. In the beginning, living in the house on Torrance and Drive was great. We'd come back from practice and there'd be naked girls in the pool. It was classic rock and roll. Naked girls in the pool, Cadillac in the driveway, getting paid, maids, plenty of pot. We had a gig at the Whiskey A Go-Go when we first moved out there, and that's when we met Sable Star who was a really nice girl. First she was Iggy's groupie, then with me, then go back to Iggy, then back to me, and then go to my brother, and back to me. We would do two sets of the whiskey, and in between sets, Sable would say, can I suck your dick? She was real open about stuff. That's what I always liked about her. <laughs> so in between our sets, Sable would suck my dick in the upstairs of men's bathroom. Sable Star. I didn't really live in Hollywood. I was about 45 minutes away. But my friend called me up one day and said, do you want to go to the Whiskey A Go-Go? This was when I was 14, and I was nuts to begin with. I always liked getting in trouble. So I said, sure, Hollywood. I thought I'd see movie stars or something. So I went to the Whiskey, and I'll never forget the girls there. I was so intrigued. I was still ugly then. I had to work on it for about a year when I was hanging out in Hollywood. I didn't get my nose fixed until I was 15. <laughs> Baby Buell. Yeah. I always liked Sable Star and Laurie Maddox, the two big groupies in LA. <laughs> Is she here? Uh, I hope She's not. Anyway, we're going <laughs> Laurie and Sable didn't give a fuck. They weren't competitive. They didn't have to be. Every rock star, I'm sorry, Michael, I forgot this oh, part was in here. Yes, um, every rock star that came to LA wanted to meet them. It wasn't the other way around. It was like, we've got to meet Sable Star and Lori Maddox, and we've got to meet Rodney Binghamheimer and Kim Fowley. There was a certain crowd you had to meet when you were in LA. Sable Star. <laughs> David Bowie came into town and wanted to meet me, so it wasn't a thing that I had to go running after him. Those days were crazy. Every day I was on the go, from one hotel to another. Because Silverhead were staying at the Hyatt House, and Bowie was staying at the Hilton, and it was just back and forth all the time. So I went up to meet David Bowie. It's funny, because he's bisexual, and he had this guy traveling with him, Freddie. Freddie was really pretty. I just sat on David's lap and said, It is true, you've got different colored eyes. Just that whole trip, and I was very good at that. Most girls are really shy, they just sit down and wait. I jump right on their laps. David said, Oh, you're very cute. Pretty, isn't she cute? I said, are we going to fuck tonight? I just came out and said it. And David started laughing, and I said, really? He goes, I'd like to, but I don't like Queenie. But I like Laurie. I said, well, we'll get rid of Queenie, and we'll meet you at the Rainbow later. So he said, okay. So me and Laurie went back to the Hyatt house, and we were screaming, we're going to fuck David Bowie. <laughs> we were so excited. <laughs> and so we went up to the Rainbow, and that was another really neat thing about being a groupie. Upstairs at the Rainbow, they have, like, one table. Me and David were sitting there with a couple other people. And to have all your friends look up and see you, that was cool. That was really cool. Then this guy came up and said, David Bowie, I'm going to kill you. Some hippie was freaking out and started, like, trying to punch him. So David's bodyguard was throwing the guy down the stairs, and David was really freaking out because he's very paranoid about that. He had voodoo dolls and stuff. Oh, I'd better go home and chant. He's trying to kill me. So he's dragging me down the stairs, and all these girls come up and saying, David, do you want to take me home? And he said, no, I'm with her tonight. So we got out of the car, and this guy's going, 
I'm coming to your show tomorrow and I'm going to fucking kill you. I've got a gun. It was very heavy. Back at the hotel, we were sitting around. I had to go to the bathroom and David came in and had a cigarette in one hand and a glass of wine. And he started kissing me. And I couldn't believe it was happening to me because there had been Roxy Music and Jay Giles, but David Bowie was the first heavy. <laughs> so we went to the bedroom and fucked for hours and he was great. I don't know where Lori was. She was always there, but she never was. You know what I mean? So I woke up that morning, and he said I had to go because his wife Angie was coming. I kept saying I wanted to meet her and stuff. He said he had a surprise for me and gave me tickets for that night's show in Long Beach. He really liked me a lot, David Bowie. I became very famous and popular after that because it was established that I was cool. I'd been accepted by a real rock star. Ron Ashton. Iggy would say about Sable, I love her, Ben. I hate her, Ben. I love her. But he wound up falling for Coral, Sable's sister, who was a pretty straight girl, not a real groupie. Coral, she was beautiful, really beautiful. She had super long, crystal gale long hair. Coral was real quiet, real straight, didn't really get fucked up, and always looked out after Sable. Sable star. The one thing my parents were always strict on was school. They let me stay out till 6 o'clock in the morning, just as long as I went to school. Oh, I hated school when I was 15. I had to have a probation officer. That's when I started living with Iggy Pop in the Hollywood Hills, and I didn't go to school for about a month. Lee Childers. Iggy brought Sable up to the house and wanted her to move in, but I wouldn't let him move her in. Meanwhile, of course, I had this gorgeous little boy that Sorinda picked up for me at the Whiskey, living in my apartment over the garage. I didn't have much ground to stand on about not letting Sable move in, but I managed to prevail. She never really moved in. She was just there a lot. Sable had a good heart, and I liked her, but she was on this general rampage of buying Billboard magazine and working her way down the list to someone she hadn't fucked yet. Wayne County came to stay with us at the house, and Sable came on to Wayne very heavy. Wayne said, but I'm a fag. Sable's thinking was probably, but you're next on the list. So Sable took all her clothes off, cut her wrists, and dove into the pool. She was floating face down in the deep end with blood going everywhere, and I was saying, Wayne, we have to get her out of here. Wayne said, why not let her drown? We'll take her over there to the cliff and pitch her off. Nobody will know where she came from. <laughs> I finally managed to reach her by hanging onto the side of the pool, got a hold of her, dragged her out, wrapped her in a blanket, bandaged her up, and gave her to Coral, who put her in the car and took her away. Ron Ashton. One day at practice, one day I was at practice and Lee Childers called up and said, you've got to come back to the house. Sable's locked herself in your room and she's threatening to kill herself. I thought, what the fuck? It wasn't like we were in love or anything. I mean, it was nice to get my dick sucked when I woke up and I liked her and we were friends, but I didn't know why she was so distraught. It definitely wasn't over me. So I go back to the house and our road manager, Eric Haddix, had to kick in the bedroom door. Sable was locked in the bathroom and I had to coax her out. Come on, open the door. She finally opened it and she was just downed out. She was naked except for some bikini underwear and I'd taken my razor and tried to cut her wrist. There were these two little lines on her wrist because it was a trap too and I just started laughing and Lisa, get her the fuck out of here. And there was poor Sable being hauled out of the house half naked. Her sister Coral got some friends to pick her up in their car. Lee was saying, this is it. No more of this bullshit, man. This is business. I can get into trouble for this. Thank God I was using track two, son, because usually I used a straight razor. <laughs> Lee Childers. I learned how to swim because of Iggy. As a child, my mother used to take me to pools and hold me like mothers are supposed to, under the stomach and let me thrash about. But none of it worked. But when I moved into the house with Iggy, he would get stoned and almost certainly fall into the pool and be floating there face down. I'd be saying, I can't swim, I can't swim, somebody grab him, somebody grab him. The rest of the band would say, fuck him, he gets what he deserves. I'd get in the pool, holding onto the sides in the deep end, thinking, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I'd be reaching for him, trying to grab his ankle and pull him in. And eventually, I learned how to swim. Thank you. going to talk to him now. Yeah. I'm sure you've got questions too. Thank you. You got it. So can you hear me? No. It's okay. turned way down. Fuck. I have really a turn loud voice. How about that? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Try it again. It's Thanks an amazing thing. You know, they're amazing writers. 
um, and, and they should be on it as such. That book is a classic book. Punk, he created punk rock. He, he named it. Did you know that? Eight, got this. 18 years old. 19. <laughs> 19 years old, he, he, he started a magazine. He called it Punk Magazine, and that's where it all came from. Legs McNeil. Okay, so let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> created rockabilly, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, she created disco. That's right, disco. Of course you did. Yeah, huge Duran fan. Yes, Massive. I was. Yeah, were you really? Yes, Who's your yes. favorite Durani? Uh, the two Jimmy Durani. The two cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I must say in my defense, though, the term punk had been used by um, Cream Magazine had called Alice Cooper punk of the year. and mm. A lot of, the term had been bandied about, but I didn't read rock and roll magazines. So when Holmstrom said, what are we going to call this thing, he wanted to do this magazine that joined um, rock and roll and comics, and I just said, oh. yeah, because of TV shows, you know, that's what they always called you on coach. Well, like James so we Cagney was, yeah. in the, the, you know, described somebody in prison that got fucked. Yeah, fucked in the ass. Right. right. So, I mean, uh, Sid Vicious, Jimmy Cagney. I see yeah. the connection. Right. But it, it really wasn't until the magazine came out that the, the scene got named. Yeah, well, it's really the magazine. Yeah. yeah, but your book—it's an extraordinary book, and, and, and the stuff that you read, of course, that whole Sable Ashton, Stooges, Ziggy thing. We were here at that time, yeah. you know. And and, it, and Sable, by the way, got married, had two kids. If you can, but, you know, because you—this is a, a moment in time, an amazing moment in time, pre-AIDS. Pre Miley Cyrus, <laughs> pre cell phones. This is an extraordinary time to be alive. Sable was spectacular, yeah. as uh, otherwise those dudes would not have been around Sable. But you know, Miss Mercy is here by the way from the GTOs. Uh, you know, so yeah. I mean, and they were tremendously pivotal. But you know what I wanted to talk to you really about was Mary Rose. Is that okay if yes, we talk yeah, about yeah, Mary yeah, Rose? Sure. Because the one thing that is terribly important here is, is that this girl, and I want to ask you the questions about this, clearly these notebooks, don't you have enough Mark? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, it is a story, it is a story. What, how did these, these notebooks get in your hands? That's what I think people would like to know. When, when Fred's sister came over and told me about the uh, daughter, daughter. Okay. Um, told me about the notebooks. I called Fred, and he arranged for me to meet the mom. And the mom, um, who's Fred? The postman who lived across the street from <laughs> lives across the street. He's the right there. We could hold the post off, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, he probably would. no. It's sad. No, he doesn't work on Saturday. No. He's Monday to Friday. But, but he brought um, it to you guys. Yeah, and I we contacted the mom, and actually, Keen scanned in the um, did the uh, uh, scanned in the original pages. Yeah. And then we had the OC. OCR them? Yeah, something it? like that. OCR. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, just, just metaphysically, just yeah. on a spiritual level, you read this, and this, this, honestly, reading this book and her writing, I was completely blown away by it. The skill that she has, it's an incredible narrative, an amazingly descriptive uh, writer. And you must have flipped the fuck out being such brilliant writers yourselves. Well, I, I Xeroxed the book, at the pages, and sent them to Jillian. I said, what do you, I think this is great. And he, I was like, We've all, we're already working on something that's going to put us way behind schedule. And he said, no, it only takes six months. And yeah. so I read it, and I freaked out, and I called him. And he put Mary Rose's mother on the phone. So you had already told her that we'd do it. Yeah. Um, but I freaked out. I loved it. Yeah, there's a wonderful uh, letter from the mom. Yeah, and, you know, she's severely crit critiqued by Mary Rose. And I must tell you that Mary Rose died of cystic fibrosis at the age of 17. 17 years old. So this book was written by a teenager, and it, it, it is so relevant to, to so many things in our fucked up world, which is being ignored by our disgusting government. Uh, well, we, we felt that we felt kind of like it was the prequel to the, the um, to Please Kill Me, you know, like yeah. all of our kind of fucked up childhoods before we found rock and roll. And, and she was a huge fan of Please Kill Me. She was. She read, which, you know, which is a whole other, you know. Which we found bit. out 
later, later yeah. which is astounding. Yeah. But the mother, who is, you know, of it, wrote this wonderful book, and I want to, you know, publicly address you two as she has saying, you know, how proud of you guys are bringing this story because, and also she is amazing to she was really to cooperate because she is severely discussed um, and described by Mary Rose in a dreadful way. I mean, there was abuse from the, the man that she was living with, who beat up her mother, beat Mary Rose up. I mean, it's a really harrowing tale. And for her to acknowledge that you did this is massive. And not ask us to change her words. Yeah. Yeah. It's Incredible. a class act. Yeah. She really, yeah. really, and, and, and tell me, did you ever, the stepfather was horrible and there were several of them, but did you ever get in touch with the real father? We, we, we tried to buy him. The, the problem with when, when a minor dies, um, when they're a minor, their estate goes to their parents. So it was both parents. And the father was a real dirtbag who abandoned um, the whole family when it, it was one and he didn't pay any child support. And he, his Pennsylvania driver's license was suspended because he didn't pay child support. So we didn't want him to receive a dime for this because he um, he really fucked everybody up. Yeah. And um, we went to court to open the estate have the father removed and then close the estate, which we thought would take six months, and it ended up taking four and a half years and thirty-five thousand dollars in legal fees because we kept getting these <coughs> male judges in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, who didn't who didn't understand what was going on and didn't want to rule on it because I thought they'd be overturned in a higher court. And we finally got this female judge after it went through three judges and she rolled on it that day. And I actually, I, mu I must admit, when I was sitting there listening to the mother talk about the, testifying in court about her husband, I was sobbing. I was just, I was, I was, because he was just such a dirtbag. I mean, this, this girl had gotten diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, which I didn't know anything about before we did this book at all. Did you? You know, we both didn't. And it's just like the worst fucking disease in the world. And I, I still don't know. But it affects the whole body. I thought it was just the lungs and stuff. But it, when you, eat, uh, it's just, it's, it's really. Of course. So we tried to hold. We didn't. We also didn't want it to become a cystic fibrosis book, right? Right. So we, we held. You know something's wrong with her, but you think it's going to be another in and out of drug rehab book, you know? Yeah. So. We held it, to the. To two thirds of the way of the book, where she finally says, "I have cystic fibrosis," yeah. and all her friends start dying. But that third, that last third of the book is um, when, you, when she realizes that she's dying, and she's 16 years Seven, old, 17, 17 years, years old. I mean, it, you, it, you, you have to read this. this. This is so important, you know. And my thing right now with these two is make a fucking movie because, especially since they went through such five years of trying to get this done. You know, that in itself, that p nobody's taking any notice of these issues. Yeah, but wait, wait a minute, Michael. Don't, don't get us into movies, because we were under contract. With and Chris you had Kelly a lousy experience, too. Oh, we were under contract. That means you never have a girlfriend again. <laughs> you know what I mean? You okay. can't do I, I refuse to <laughs> you listen to you say this. Because this is an amazing story that is a great story should be told, whether you like it or not. Yeah, but... What? We agree, yes, yes, we agree. Ah, I see at last. See, I just badger people into submission. But it is a great and important story, and it has to be told. And your search for it is commendable. Ladies and gentlemen, Lex McNeil. Thank you so much for coming. We love you. Does anybody have a question? Any of you guys have a question? Yes, Howie. Howie. Having not read the book, I'm not sure I understand, uh, and maybe the other people don't either. Did she die? Did you meet ever meet her? Did she no. die before you she wrote dead. it? Or, and what is she the, died in 99. What does the postman have to do with it? I know, it's <laughs> oh, okay. convoluted. Okay. And how, or okay. why did all her friends die? And what, yeah. what are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I live across the street from this little post office, and the postmaster's daughter came over to borrow a book from me. And I asked her, what are you reading? And she listed some of the popular titles of the day. And then she said, but the best thing I ever read were these journals. This wasn't actually a, a diary. They were they were just written in these um, notebooks, no, little notebooks. Yeah, like steno pads. Uh, uh, Disney Hercules Notebook 1 and 3. What were the titles? The, 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 yeah, the, I just, I just it, They were spiral brown notebooks. It. And we got them. There were 600 pages in, in its entirety. And we couldn't use 
much of it because it was that she wrote a lot of fiction. But the stuff that she wrote that was nonfiction about her life was just so terrific, I thought. So I Xeroxed it and I sent it to Jillian. And we decided to edit them into a diary. And we actually invented the title Dear Nobody and her writing to Dear Nobody because we thought that's what she would do, you know, because she was so lonely. So the book is about her when she starts when she's 15 and goes until she dies when she's 17. And it's just all her. Yeah. yeah. Why did her friends die? Um, her friends died of cystic fibrosis, too. Um, she, she when they were 13. She did a war. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. She had to go <laughs> in. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Got any questions? No. For these two? For you guys? Yes, sir. How does doing this book change you? In what way? The question was, how does the book change these two? You could have asked that over at breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to witness this. <laughs> this is Tom, who lets us stay with him every time we're in LA. Thank you. Now you're um, paying. What? <laughs> now you're paying. <laughs> yeah. Did it affect you guys? Did yeah. It you? Yes. Would it affect you enough to do five years of your life trying to get it out? For one thing. I went insane. <laughs> yeah, you were already yeah, question. I want to say something about Lee Children. Uh, he was a friend of mine, and uh, when I read your book, it was like freaking me out because, first of all, Connie Grip was my girlfriend, and I had no idea what had happened. I knew that why Arthur Kane came over to my house at Shuggies, and I didn't know why he was there. Now I know because Connie has that connection. And, and then Lee Children has never. I, when I got together with Lee Childers, he was, we were doing Levi and the Rockettes. And I just saw Lee do his photo. And we were speaking to each other. And it's like we were never apart for like 35 years, as usual. And we were making plans to meet a couple of days later. And boom, he was gone. He passed away. Uh, he passed away on yeah. yeah. Rocket Peace. I don't know if you oh, What a wonderful man he was. He oh, I great. loved him. He was flamboyant. We went to Shreveport. And, with the Rockettes and did Louisiana Hayride, and he was just, just so amazing. Oscar Wilde Rock. Yeah. <laughs> so, anybody else? Tom, I, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about it. Okay, you know, maybe tomorrow breakfast. Yeah. yeah. She's actually exactly the same. She's not coming back till Wednesday. She's at the Chateau. Oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> the so Instead you guys... The, I'm I at guess, the Beverly Hills Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get the number out, room number? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank Book Super. Just so fabulous. Yeah. And thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So did, did you guys have any Thank you for coming out, and if you would like to have your book signed, you can meet the authors in the back of the store. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah.